Welcome into Tech Sags Rewind presented by Yeti. Good show today. Um, real classic conversation with Tom Hart. Hopefully you guys will check that one out. I might have made a little vocal mistake. I might have said something the wrong way. It was taken the wrong way, double entendre, however you want to take it. But that was good time to talk to Tom. We talked about uh, Shane McMahon, his old buddy, and uh, some other things happening in his life, like uh, his mascot wearing days. Beyond that, Andrew Monaco in studio. We talked everything with Andrew. We talked about the, uh, the Masters and Sam Bennett. A little basketball talk, a little baseball talk, a little football talk. We got a preview on Auburn football. We're trying to catch in with all the teams that AM is playing with their spring ball. And also, OB, big shot of the week. That and more here on TechSags Rewind. All right, let's get into our big shot of the week now that I brought the show down completely and made us cry. OB, I'm going to let you go first. Um, you know, it's hard for me to say a big shot. I'll say the big shots with the, the Dreamweavers. Texas A&M women's tennis. I knew you were going, going there. Uh, uh, Mark Weaver and his group go down to Georgia like 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 the devil went down to Georgia, except they yeah. were like Johnny. I know this means I know the you. song. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know and, the song. And, and they they beat Georgia, and uh, it was impressive. And I'm trying, you know, I'd like to point out one, but you really can't. And but uh, there was a um, I'm going to say her name wrong. Mia Cooper's. Yeah, and I think she had the. Forgive me, guys, if if I've got this wrong, but I think she had the 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 win that 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 clinched the win that the 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 the, the tournament not tournament the series victory whatever you right. call it. So just just an, an, an impressive to go down there and on the road. Or I don't know if they maybe they weren't on the road, but just to go beat uh, a, a team a top five team like that. Well, you know what we can. Individualize it and just say Mark Weaver. That Mark guy knows Weaver, how to lead a program. Dream Weaver, man. Smiling Mark Weaver. I'm waiting for the for the uh, Dream Weaver song to come back now for the uh, in the bumpy music. Well, Sean just heard it. Who so. is that? Is that Jerry Rafferty? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're asking me. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Okay. It's Jerry. probably yeah. Bad, bad Bunny. Yeah. Uh, no, it's Jerry Lawler. Oh, uh, the gentleman king, Jerry Law, the king, the king. We saw his uh, barbecue place in Memphis. Didn't yes, we? we did. Yes, we did. Or is it a barbecue place? Or is it yeah, a club? it was a barbecue yeah. place. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple. How okay. about Brett Minnick? What do you think about Brett Boy, Minnick's Brett performance Minnick. this weekend? What did he uh, have? Three home runs. He had three home runs. He went one for three in the in the final game. Uh, had a home run, but he had two in the uh, Friday game. Look at that. Four forty four for the weekend. Three homers. Four RBI. Three walks and one stolen base. What makes you believe that Hugh Freeze will fit? I think Hugh Freeze, having coached in the SEC before at Ole Miss, he knows the lay of the land. He knows what it takes to win in the SEC, and that's to get players. And it's not to stay in your office like Brian Harson did when recruits and their families came, and he refused to even see them like he was the emperor. Uh, that's not going to get it done, and that's not going to get it done in the SEC. I mean, Harson is was all about – you know, let's just talk ball, thinking that he could out-scheme you. You freeze understands, having coached in this league, that you better get the players. He's confident in his coaching ability. He's confident in scheming things in the offense he runs. But it doesn't mean anything, guys, if you don't have the right guys to run your offense, you don't have good players. I think that's where he's completely different. He's got a different personality, too, that, that I think is a lot more relational with folks. So I'll ask you, because it was reports, it was buzzing. Everybody thought Lane Kiffin would end up there. How close was it to Lane Kiffin being the head coach at Auburn? I think it was really close. I think it was a lot closer than, obviously, Ole Miss wanted to come out with. I think that there were some family ties there and some family pools that I think uh, you know led for him to stay there. I think some early reports, things getting leaked, uh, was detrimental to, to him coming to Auburn. But I really, truly believe that there was – it wasn't just uh, smoke. There was some fire there, and I think at the last minute, probably Ole Miss did a really, really good job of, of moving some things around and, and really making the decision very, very difficult uh, for Lane Kiffin to leave. But I, I think it was it was real, and I think it was very close to happening. How active has Auburn been in the portal this uh, this year? Well, they've been very active from a defensive line standpoint. they got three or four guys. They got Kite from Maryland. They got Lawrence Johnson from Purdue. Justin Rogers, a former five-star from Kentucky, he's been he came in the portal. Two linebackers, one from LSU, uh, Demario Tolan, Austin Keys from Ole Miss, another starter. Uh, so they've been very active in the portal along the defensive line. But where they've really, really made headway is what Auburn has struggled with for years, especially under Gus Malzahn, 
and that is getting good offensive line recruits. Auburn basically went out and replaced the starting offensive line, which, by the way, was good news. It was addition by subtraction, and got three starters that are going into A-Day. Gunnar Britton, a right tackle from Western Kentucky, Dylan Wade, a, a left tackle from Tulsa, and a starting center, Avery Jones, who flipped from Illinois, who was a uh, Eastern Carolina starter. All those guys, every single one of them, were transfers, and they will solidify this offensive line. So their biggest gain in the transfer portal was along the offensive line, and then they had a couple returning offensive linemen that were some of their better offensive. And they also got a guard uh, that in, in the portal as well, uh, Miller, that was a Duco guy that, just, that they're really high on. So it's going to be interesting, but I think that they've done a good job from the offensive line, and that was a weak, weak area for Auburn from a position group for years now. Considering how the offense was hit or miss, the starting pitching struggled, the pitching staff has struggled, and, and considering the, even at 100% full strength, the, the schedule that they had to start the season, yeah. they're not in that bad of a spot. Yeah, and in that schedule to start the season, they had a lead in, in the majority of games. Mm-hmm. I, this, is, this is me. Okay, this is Andrew talking. I think that when that schedule came out, I think LSU and Tennessee said, oh my gosh, we've got A&M at mm-hmm. the beginning of the schedule. That's how I look at this team. And, and I, I think you're starting to see a little bit of that swagger. I, there aren't many teams that lost your starting third baseman and your starting right fielder. Brett Minnick coming back last week after missing six weeks. Trevor Warner being out two separate weekends. Now that they're back, it helps the entire, not just those spots, but the entire lineup. Sure. And the pitching is who can you depend on, not just as a starter, but then coming out of the bullpen. That's going to, you, you, you think you can have all the ideas, but we saw on Sunday what a strike thrower or strike throwers can do. This offense, and you can't ever get into that, oh, it's the offense versus the defense. You can't do that. It's got to be that trust within one another. You take a look at Ole Miss. They have an entirely different weekend pitching lineup. There are three starters on the weekend they don't have. You throw up your hands or you say, hey, your chance to go out there. To me, all, all the pitchers who have come in, if it pays off, it, it hasn't paid off immediately, but will it pay off down the line? It could be this season. It could be next season. It could be some. But to me, I, I'm a big baptism by fire. Yeah. Because you find out, David, Do I belong here? You dream about being here, but when you realize I belong here, that's Will Johnston in a nutshell to me. Every time I've talked with Will, he doubted that. He doesn't doubt himself anymore because he belongs here. I don't know if Evan Oshenbeck went through that, but he belongs on that mound. Brad Rudis, strike thrower. They're never going to impress you with the gun, right? You're not going to say, oh, wow, but you're going to look and say, wow, that slider was 78. Oh, he just threw that curveball at 81. Now the 90 looks a little faster. In, out, up, down. You have to pitch, not throw. And those are the strike throws that Jim, uh, Jim Schlossnagel was looking for. Well, we can use football as an example. Football, there aren't as many opportunities. It took those young players time to really start Agreed. gelling, especially on the offensive line, right? Baseball, at least there's opportunities. Mm-hmm. And again, Schloss talked about it on Sunday night. They're not that far off the pace that they were last year. You can't say history's going to repeat itself, but right. at least there's that to grab onto. To me, I'm a big, if, if past is prologue, and for me, it's the experienced guys have gone through this. That's the one thing. If you have nothing but freshmen, they have nothing right. to reach back on. But you have the, the experience of this team that you know that Jack Moss is going to hit, and you know that Brett Minnick's going to hit, and you know that Ryan Targach is going to hit. And at no point in the course of the season have I ever felt like the moment is too big for any of them. That's the exciting thing about Justin Lampkin taking the mound. Or even a Troy Wansing who's going to pitch tonight, who hasn't pitched in the SEC, but it's like, yeah, again, I I belong here. Shane Sedale, yeah, just go out there. You have control of that ball on the mound. The game doesn't start until I throw it. And it's that confidence. And that's the game within the game, right? You're just throwing two Max Coffer or Hank Bard or J.D. Gregson. That is your job. And I, I like, this is where I like the pitch com, I'm going to be honest. You look down at, that, at, at, that, at your wrist, and if Nate Yeske says, I'm confident that you can throw your, this pitch, well, then that's awesome. That's what I'm going to throw. And, and you just, it takes a lot of that doubt. Like, ooh, can I throw that pitch for a strike? No, he thinks I can, and boom, you throw that strike to the plate. I'm going to ask you a wrestling thing. I don't, did you see Shane McMahon take his uh, ACL out the other day? 
Do you know what I'm talking about? No. So, you know, he's the son of Vince. I guess he's a wrestler, yeah, too. I know Shane. Yeah, Shane. I've got his number, humble brag. But, uh, yeah, Shane was heavily involved with XFL in, in 2020. Yeah, well, we might have to do a three-way on the show. Well, you know what I mean, FaceTime. And <laughs> I hear the guys in the back. You know what I mean, all right? Back in the day, in the 90s, we had the th- whatever. He was doing a wrestling move, and he, like, tore his knee right there in the middle. Of, and I just... Thought I would throw that out at you. Like, at, I don't know how old he is. He's got to be our age, probably, maybe a little bit older. Yeah. Jumping around, trying to do a drop kick, rips his knee open. This was in LA. This was this weekend. This WrestleMania? Was at WrestleMania, yeah. What a scene. What an absolute scene. Um, Shane, walking around with Shane in public, I was, I was shocked. Like, here he was when I were, was working with him as an executive, which is what he is. But the interaction with fans, and these are just casual fans that maybe weren't expecting to see him, but but saw him on the field or walking through the stands, they treated him like the character that he plays in the role that he plays in the ring. And I was just fascinated by, you know, the dichotomy of, wait, am I talking with Shane McMahon, the guy who's an executive within the XFL, or Shane McMahon, the guy who's going to get in the ring when he shouldn't be in the ring and tear his ACL. Uh, it's awesome. I saw Brock Lesnar come back. I thought that was big. It came, that was on raw last night. Like this is. Did you watch raw last night? Cause my boy, bad buddy was I, on there. I only saw the snippets. I only saw the snippets, but um, the entertainment value of that property, which is why it's being sold for billions of dollars to endeavor and UFC. Uh, it, it, it's amazing to me the staying power that it has. Like, think about the ups and downs of what were niche sports that became big. Like NASCAR in the mid late '90s became huge, yep. and then it fell off again. Um, wrestling WWE became big, and it's stayed there even with the turnover of the fan base because I think that people grow out of it as fans, right? But then there's another. The marketing is so good. And now working hand in hand with Dwayne Johnson on this version of the XFL, you know, he's shared with us some of the, the marketing plans that they've used that were so successful to build it to a superstar sport or entertainment, however you want to phrase it, um, that can be used in a lot of different uh, entertainment venues to, to prom- in, in promotion and get people out at, at events. All right, that's going to do it. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, tell your friends, all that good jive. How about Mark Weaver behind us? Good times had by all. We'll see you next time.